I'm here with the uh, Los Angeles Office of HUD. We're responsible for two-thirds of California, from Fresno to San Diego, 22 million. And the topic of predatory lending is something that uh, I selected simply because it's very personal to me, not necessarily because that's the only thing I'm involved in. Our department's responsible for providing housing for the homeless, for the elderly, for people with disabilities, for providing insurance on multifamily mortgages, five or more. We also provide grants to nonprofits and for profits to provide what we consider more than shelter. In other words, once you have a shelter, that's not the end of it. There's need for services and programs after you move into a residence. So we also have grants available for that. On behalf of Secretary Mel Martinez, the Secretary of HUD, and the President, there's basically three of five initiatives that uh, brings me here today. The first primary initiative is home ownership. The second is our commitment to faith-based and making sure that faith-based organizations and nonprofits have more access to the HUD programs. And then thirdly, a commitment to end chronic homelessness. The subject of predatory lending or prohibitive REBA, as I say, is something very close to me because I am speaking as a victim of predatory lending. It's very clear to me when I was five years old and going out of my home, being escorted uh, in the arms of my mother, along with my father and sister, and the marshal at that time was escorting us out of our home. My father had bought his home using the GI plan after fighting in World War II and fighting in Korea. It was the first property he bought coming to Los Angeles. And it is clear to me, as if it was yesterday, the impact of predatory lending. As I say, that was when I was five years old. I got a copy of the documents that were used to get us out of our home. And that was part of my briefcase until I graduated from college. That was my motivation to know as much about how money works as any motivation I could ever have. So I'm speaking not in an ex as an expert on predatory lending, but as a victim of predatory lending. So I'll share with you some of the um, major issues and some of the anti-predatory lending steps that are being taken today. The one major decision I'd like to point out is that we have subprime lenders. And we don't want to start equating subprime lenders with predatory lenders. There's a major, major difference. As you know, in the early 70s, after the federal government saw many cities and neighborhoods and communities start falling to the wayside, they felt that it was a need for reinvestment in those communities. So they put on the books something called the Community Redevelopment Reinvestment Act, CRA. And they start requiring financial institutions to lend money back into those communities to sustain those communities. That was a very important act. It was about 25 years ago. But it was recognizing the importance of community. Subprime lenders <clears throat> versus predatory lenders. Predatory lenders tend to obscure information. They tend to pressure you into transactions you may not understand fully. They tend to get you into mortgage projects, products that you may not need. There's hidden information. All of these are characteristics of your predatory lender. Just like getting a report card in uh, elementary or high school, especially elementary school, uh, they tend to look at a consumer and based on their credit history, you fall into an A, B, C, or possibly D category. And based on that, uh, it, it tends to influence the rates and the terms that you're able to borrow at. But again, subprime lenders are lenders that may lend to a, a qualified borrower who may have a B, C, or even a D credit. But understand, the motivation and the service is being provided is not one to influence and sell a product that unwillingly uh, that individual and that consumer should not um, be obtaining. So there is a need. And you do have high risk bars from, for whatever reason. Whereas 
your predatory lenders tend to be motivated by what? By greed. I'll touch briefly in, in, on several of the techniques. I'll limit my remarks for the sake of time. But steering. Steering is basically taking a qualified borrower and moving them from an affordable situation to maybe one that they can't afford. Many instances, a qualified borrower may, based on their credit rating and their income, require and should get a much lower rate or pay lower fees. But you have to look at who receives those fees and who benefits, and that is the most motivating force in terms of their transactions. Many times you have balloon payments, and this is the favorite. And this is the situation that my family found themselves in, is a balloon payment. It was a one-year loan. The loan had a balloon, which was three-thirds three the value of the property, which obviously the lender at the time they made the loan, no, could not be, be, be repaid. Just as recent as yesterday, actually the 21st, if you were to look into the Los Angeles Times headlines, you have a situation where a woman, her family obtained a $152,000 loan for three years. The cost of that loan cost them $85,000 in repayment. This is Los Angeles Times, March, March the 21st. So even though we have actions in place now trying to curb that, it still happens. A couple other techniques is insurance. Having credit insurance or dis disability insurance. It's not always required. After all, if a consumer has insurance with their lender or with their borrower, why would they need a lender's insurance in addition to uh, having uh, the ability to pay? Prepayment penalties. Once you get locked into a, what I will call, quote unquote, bad contract, the predatory lender would want to make sure that you stay in it. And the way they keep you in it is they have what's called a lockout clause, which basically says, you can't pay us our money back, period, for X amount of time. So you're locked out from even going to refinance once you've discovered the situation that you find yourself into. Flipping. Quite often, on a short-term mortgage, what happens if a consumer can't repay that balloon? Very gladly, the predatory lender will refinance that a second, third, and fourth time. And on each occasion, that lender and the broker will receive a fee. Outright fraud, that's not unusual. We've experienced that in HUD, where certain of the lenders sometimes will actually forge documents to make the transaction work. On the books now, there are federal, state, and local legislation that has been put in place in the last three or four years trying to prevent predatory lending. As far as public education, that's one of the key motivations of uh, Freddie, Freddie Mac's program. And I have to commend Freddie Mac. Uh, we have some speakers here today from Freddie Mac. Uh, I have to commend Freddie Mac for putting together their program. And it's, it's basically entitled, Don't Borrow Your Trouble. And finally, we have the new rules that applies to the new RESPA transactions. Without getting into the RESPA rules, there's three basic areas, and I'll keep it very simple. The consumer needs to know all of the details on the transaction and needs to understand exactly what the cost of capital is going to be and exactly what fees they're going to pay. I mean, that's the easiest way to summarize the RESPA law. 